um, herbivores are nitrogen limited. This might be especially true for lysines as the additional nitrogen um, expense of providing amino acids to their host animals. Whereas the carnivorous lifestyle seems a little bit easier at some point. You don't have to deal with secondary compounds anymore in your plants or with structural barriers in you know, plant fibers. Although if you're feeding on insects, you do have to have some way to cope with feeding the chitin in your in insect exoskeletons. But all of a sudden, you're also feeding on very nitrogen-rich foods, or in the case of prophylactic feeders, on liquid foods that have already been partially digested. So I maintain that the, the gut microbiomes of this humanus caterpillar, which is on the left, feeding on like a very fibrous and highly toxic cycad leaf, might be very different from the gut microbiome of this lefira caterpillar, which is shown from below on the, on the right, feeding on an ant larva. And so this has led me to the question of do we observe convergence in the bacterial communities associated with lysinate species with similar diets? And to answer this, I went on a big collecting expedition to try and collect lysinates from across as much of the phylogenetic and geographic and ecological range of the and I was able to collect about 30 species from four subfamilies. I think this should be 10 tribes. Um, and that included 21 herbivorous species, nine carnivorous ones, and then one phy phytopredaceous species, which I collected both in its herbivorous and its carnivorous stages. I starved the larvae to allow their guts to evacuate. And then I dissected their guts and set them off for six months every time sequencing and then characterized the communities in very standard. And sort of the, the flip side of asking, do we see convergence in these communities, is asking, are the communities associated with carnivorous and herbivorous lifestyles different? And so I'm going to um, address this question with three really basic metrics for describing uh, gut community. So do we see differences according to bacterial abundance, or the differences in bacterial load between carnivores and herbivores? Are there differences in bacterial richness um, or taxonomic diversity? And do we observe differences in for the first question, for bacterial load, we see that the number of bacteria or bacterial abundance in carnivores and herbivores is very similar. Um, there are no detectable differences in a man with EEG test. It's the same for richness and also for Shannon diversity, that at any taxonom bacterial taxonomic level, we do not see differences in the number of bacterial OTUs in carnivores or herbivores. And strangely, it seems much the same in composition. As well. So these are NMDS plots of unifrac distance metrics. Um, each point is an individual that's colored according to whether it's apitopagus or phytopagus, and the shapes represent the different tribes. So this is um, an attempt to squint and find patterns according to maybe butterfly like phylogeny or diet. And really, you can squint all you want, but especially in the unweighted unifrac um, plot, which only accounts for bacterial presence and absence, it's not um, abundance weighted. It's, uh, it's quite a lot of scatter. It's hard to pick up any pattern of structure. We do see more structure in the weighted unifrac plots, although, if anything, the points tend to cluster according to species. We don't find distinct clustering according to tribe or according to diet. And to poke at this a little bit further, so here I'm showing the um, phyla that are present in each of these species. And instead of organizing it in terms of carnivore and herbivore, I'm giving you a little bit finer resolution. So we have um, Herbivorous or phytophagous species sort of from this point to the left. These are all um, various plant food sources, including lichen. These four plant genera are all very closely related, so I'm sort of lumped them together. And then we have the carnivorous um, feeders on the right. And there are two points to take from this. One is that at the phyla level, these are really um, pretty typical of bacteria or animal associated bacterial communities dominated by proteobacteria, firmicutes, bacteria DDs, actinobacteria. Also at this level, though, we can start to see that there are some sort of species-level variation observed, um, even within species that have similar diets, like the hemoptera feeders, and even among congeners with similar diets. And this is especially evident when we look at um, other taxonomic levels. So if you look at the dominant genera among herbivores, these are the genera of the top 10 most abundant OTUs in each species. We see a lot of variability between species, um, regardless of diet. And it, it's fun when you're not a microbiologist and you do a microbiome survey and you just end up Googling all these bacteria that you've never heard of. And you find that most of the time, nobody knows anything about them. And, or you find like, that once they were sequenced from a cow ruben and a watermelon blight or something really bizarre. Yeah. Um, but I do want to highlight that some of the most common ones 
here, and even some of the less common ones, like this um, allocyclin bacillus, um, the methylobacterium, Pantea, um, Pseudomonas, these are all really common bacteria that are found in soil, in water, in the phylosphere. So these are, this is likely a signature of a lot of environmentally derived and to use in these dominant genera. It becomes a little bit more interesting in the dominant genera of carnivores because we do see some of the same uh, soil borne bacteria, for example. But we also see things like loads of Bocanera sequences in this Finisecant caterpillar, which is aphids. We see a lot of Tremolia in species that eat mealybugs, or a lot of Lomobacter in species that eat plant hoppers. So we're picking up a lot of insect symbionts, but they're the insect symbionts of the Haemopteran prey that these caterpillars are feeding. So again, a strong signature of food variety to use. Um, so I can't really provide any conclusions, but I can provide some observations and some half-cooked explanations for what we see here. We see a strong signature of food and environmentally derived OTUs in these communities, but we don't see evidence of convergence among species with similar diets. If anything, there's convergence at the species level, but not really beyond that. The major caveat here is that this is only looking at taxonomic composition, so I haven't looked at functional diversity at all, and it's entirely possible that we do see convergence in the functional profiles in these communities without seeing convergence at the taxonomic level. Um, so I think there, there's certainly some more metagenomic it's also possible that there are important differences at the taxonomic level, but these are represented by rare OTUs. And this is, uh, these are less likely to be picked up in these sequencing and statistical methods that I've used. It could also be that I have insufficient sampling, that I need more replicates in the species, or that I haven't collected sufficiently across sort of the dietary or phylogenetic breadth. And as we've heard um, sort of more and more, it's possible that the bacteria in these guts are not conferring a nutritional benefit, but are important for other reasons that maybe they're important for development. Um, but I want to highlight that it's also possible that um, whatever requirements the host has in terms of cellulose degradation or protein metabolism, these might be encoded actually by the host genome, and they're not relying on gut bacteria for these functions. So if I can leave you with a, a maybe unpopular um, reminder, it's that the microbiome is not the answer to everything. It's that um, all sorts of hosts, insect hosts in particular, have many strategies available to them, and that associating with beneficial bacteria is only one of them. Um, specializations are the exception and not the rule. And it may be that there are insects or maybe even entire insect groups that are not associated with specialized bacteria. I think these are more generalist groups. Um, so as we continue today and in general to hear about these really amazing experimental systems that describe elegant symbioses, um, I just want to remind us that it's useful to ask ourselves how generalizable these symbioses might be, how common they are across insects, um, and ask ourselves how representative they might be across insects.